Hello everyone! Welcome to the September 2017 Friday Flashback Review from the CC Network. I'm Freddie Thomas, your ever-reliable host as always, and after a one-month break which seemed to go on forever, we return with the Friday Flashback Big Four series, looking back this time at the first pay-per-view I ever saw on TV in its entirety, Survivor Series 2003. Now, following SummerSlam, Raw and SmackDown had their landscapes literally turned up on its head, as the red brand had good rising over evil, with Goldberg unseating Triple H's nine-month reign as champion, Shane had Kane on the ropes in their bloodbath, and the Dudley Boys vanquished Lara's estance. While on the blue side of things, evil was slowly overcoming the good, as Brock Lesnar won the WWE Championship from Kurt Angle, Paul Heyman became the GM after Vince fired his daughter at No Mercy, and Tajiri blinded Nidia, resulting in James Jamie Noble, the longtime heel, becoming babyface. And as for Los Figuereros, well, they were in a bad way too, but all seem to be pointing to Survivor Series to be the final resting place of 2003's biggest storylines, as Shane McMahon, Goldberg, The Undertaker, Kurt Angle, and Stone Cold all faced off against their biggest rivals with everything to play for. And in the case of the younger McMahon and Taker, well, their perspective resting places were literal ones, an ambulance and a grave, respectively. Now, this show is remembered fondly by me, and it did well on its prior outing some six years ago on this very same program, but with my established review system now firmly in place for the last three or four years, I want to know if this show really is as good as I remember it. Well, it's time for me to find out. WWE Survivor Series 2003 took place on the 16th of November 2003 at the America Airlines Center in Dallas, Texas, with 13,487 fans on hand to see the scores be firmly settled. Now, this was the first pay-per-view to be held in this venue after hosting some Raw and SmackDown shows for the year prior, and it has since become a regular WWE venue for a lot of good things, as it has hosted more Raw and SmackDown shows along the way, along with a few good pay-per-views with 2008's Night of Champions, 2010 and 2014's Hell in a Cell events, and most recently TLC 2016. Now, Build a Bridge by Limp Bizkit was the pay-per-view's theme song, the last of which that a new metal band had in their storied musical history with the company going back through the Attitude Era, and it was replaced by the stock music right off the bat by Will Hummel on the DVD and network versions, but unlike the rest of the stock music brigade, this is actually one that I like listening to, which is really, really strange. But with all that out of the way, let's get this review started. And we kick things off with SmackDown's Survivor Series elimination match, which pit Team Angle against Team Lesnar, which of course had Kurt Angle, Chris Benoit, John Cena, Bradshaw and Hardcore Holly against the WWE Champion Brock Lesnar, the US Champion Big Show A-Train, Nathan Jones, remember him? And a young whippersnapper by the name of Matt Morgan, fresh out of OVW. Now, following No Mercy, Kurt Angle, John Cena, Chris Benoit, and A-Train intertwined their feuds together for two consecutive tag matches, one ending in a no contest, while the other having the former WWE Tag Team Champions and Technical Maestros coming out on top, with A-Train turning on his then-heel partner Cena, with the Doctor of Thugonomics responding back with an FU for his troubles. Now, Angle was really on a high following this, as he decided to form Team Angle for Survivor Series to give the man who beat him for his championship back in September a good hiding, and he had Ben Wabi as first tag partner despite their history together, and he rounded off his team with the APA, and of course, most importantly, a returning hardcore Holly who was looking for a lot of vengeance against Lesnar after he broke his neck some 13 months prior. Now, speaking of Lesnar, he was happy to know he wouldn't be defending the title against Undertaker at Survivor Series, which we will get to later as to why, and we were still angry at Big Show for losing to the dead man in a handicap match. Again, I will note that later on. His former mentor, and now GM Paul Heyman, introduced the champion to a returning Nathan Jones, and as I've mentioned, an OVW fresh Matt Morgan in wanting to form Team Lesnar alongside himself and the Big Show to become the most dominant team Survivor Series has ever seen, in order to get Angle's athletic yet bruising selection be counted. Lesnar at first though was suspicious because obviously Heyman screwed him over in the past year. Logically, you'd want to ensure that he'd never team up with him again. However, he saw sense of the idea and agreed to it, later choosing John Cena as his fifth teammate, something that the Doctor of Thugonomics rejected resoundly. Now, Lesnar and Big Show face the APA later on, beating them down with chairs, crushing Farouk's leg in the process, ruling him out of the Thanksgiving slamboree that is Survivor Series, leaving Kurt Angle with a bit of a dilemma over who his replacement would be, as A-Train decimated Cena and subsequently joined in the gap in Lesnar's gargantuan team, while Cena himself decided to reluctantly side with Angle after 
after assisting them from repeated beatdowns from the WWE Champion's teammates. But Angle's teammates, especially Benoit, hated the idea that Cena was going to be on the team, as he spent most of his WWE career insulting every single person he came across, making their lives miserable, and the Doctor said he would only join if he had the ability to beat up Team Sasquatch. Simple enough, really, but Benoit stressed that if Cena didn't pull his weight, Angle would be the one who would pay for it quite violently. And while Cena and Benoit managed to beat Lesnar and Big Show in a tag match later on in the evening on that final show before the pay-per-view, the question was whether all of Team Angle could coexist and overcome the size and power of Lesnar's arsenal. Well, Cena did manage to pull his weight. Hell, he carried 500 pounds of it on his shoulders as he FU'd the Big Show to pick up the win for the team as a doctor and Chris Benoit survived as Team Lesnar was defeated in 13 minutes and 15 seconds. Now, this match was exactly what the night needed to start itself off with a fast, furious and aggressive bout that got the crowd on their feet and didn't relent while also telling a great story of Benoit and Cena fighting and surviving. While Angle was able to make Lesnar tap and Hardcore Holly, he got a minor amount of revenge for his worth while Bradshaw got nothing, meaning Farouk was left out in the cold, sadly. The quick eliminations early on were quite jarring though and having Morgan and Jones last as long as they did, while nice for them, didn't really add much to what was quite an exciting match. The heels and faces Faces all looked strong as they sparred for supremacy, and honestly, it was very brutal and crisply done in a match that felt rushed at times and didn't nearly last as long as it could have, despite doing all the right things it needed to on a story front to make it work. This match was seen as welcoming party into the upper mid card and face territory, and it gave Lesnar a bloody nose figuratively as he tapped out for the second time since SummerSlam, compounding his misery despite not losing face as a dominant WWE champion. Now it could have been longer and less insanely quick with a little more body psychology but all in all I couldn't have wished for a better start to this show with a three star rating to boot coming from this match. Smackdown opened the show strong and utilized its talent well to do it even if a quarter of the participants were out within two minutes. All I can say we need to bring on the next one. And we follow it up quickly with the women's championship match from Raw as the incumbent champion Molly Holly took on Lita who was fighting her first pay-per-view championship match since WrestleMania 18 some 20 months prior. And because since that match Lita suffered a neck injury around April May of 2002 while filming a TV show and Eric Bischoff decided to fire her because she hadn't recovered fully from it only to have Austin much to his irritants hire her back leading to Molly Holly going in and out of a feud with with Lita around Unforgiven. But while Lita and Trish started to be embroiled in this Christian and Jericho admiration love story, it meant that the champion and her future challenger didn't really get the chance to really go to blows with each other. And it inevitably meant that they spent months just stagnating. Lita though did manage to win a number one contendership match for Survivor Series by beating Gail Kim, Trish and Victoria in a fatal four-way match two weeks before the pay-per-view to get it signed. Now on the last Raw, finally some story development, Molly bemoaned that the fans believed in her challenger's road to recovery as she was going to teach her a lesson and beat her ass, which led Lita to come down and attack Molly, only to be attacked by Gail Kim, leaving the challenger vulnerable going into this match. And the comeback was not a fairy tale for Lita, as just like that final Raw appearance, she was blindsided, this time by an exposed turnbuckle, losing as Molly retained in 6 minutes and 48 seconds. Now this match, despite the quality of the two women involved, was nothing special as a sluggish and slow yet athletic contest was not that well received after the opener and did not get the crowd's attention. The limited psychology and the abrupt nature of Molly's win didn't help matters as the crowd went into Lita. Even if she did manage to add some pace on offense, she rarely got the chance to utilize it as she was beaten down for most of the duration of the contest. This match was a simple one to book and I'm surprised they got it mostly wrong. They had a good technical versus high-flying mix of offense there to balance off any potential pace fluctuations. And you have Molly trying to win only by cheating, obviously, for Lita to then come back and win the belt and secure the fairy tale return. It was really simple, but they didn't go for it at all and kept an underwhelming Molly as champion for the foreseeable future, despite the fact I know she's a very underrated wrestler, but this match did not do any favors in highlighting her. And as for Lita, it would take a year plus for her to get her hand on that belt before another neck injury disrupted that. It's sad when this should have been the coronation for her and it was the wrong booking decision in my honest opinion. And to make matters worse, 
Kale Kim paid her part in the build-up and didn't make an appearance on the show. I don't understand that. Progression is needed. Overall, this match was filler at best with just enough for me to warrant a one-star rating. I never really remembered it as being many more than that. And as a result, it kicks off Raw's night in quite underwhelming fashion indeed. And speaking of Raw, the next bout was five months in the making, as it was the first ever ambulance match between Shane McMahon and Kane. Now, since SummerSlam, the hatred between these two only intensified further as they tried to hurt and kill each other any chance they came into contact with one another. McMahon superkicked Kane into a light dumpster. Kane got his revenge with a shocking electrocution to the McMahon air's testicles using a car battery. And that followed up with a last man standing match in Unforgiven, which Shane lost after he missed the dive from the stage. Age. He nearly killed himself to be that, and he was attacked in the hospital room by Kane the next night. But once, of course, the McMahon heir was out of the hospital, he returned the favour by committing something that you would literally call attempted murder by chasing the big red machine into a limo, and with the help of a 2x4, sending that limo into an 18-wheeler in that now infamous scene that was the highlight of Raw's intro for about three years. Now, despite suffering numerous life-threatening injuries, the man who can't be killed woke up and beat the the hell out of his doctor, coming to Raw the following week to take Shane out, but instead gave him one last chance at Survivor Series to end it all for good, and there was no amount of suffering that he wasn't willing to inflict. Now Shane, because he was that pissed and angry at Kane, broke Test's foot a few weeks prior, which meant that both men had to face off in an ODQ match, only for Shane to aggravate the injury and send his opponent to the hospital. Now, Kane admitted, after seeing that senseless violence, that all that happened before before it as well meant that Shane was just as twisted as he was, with the young man affirming that at Survivor Series that one of these two men would be joining Test in the ER as the first ever ambulance match was was signed for the pay-per-view. Now, on the final roll before the show, you'd think everything was building up greatly. These two would kill each other on the last show to really heighten up their blood feud. Well, no, actually, because they took each other out to dinner at a restaurant. Yeah, I don't really get that either. Where Kane discussed all that he'd done and how much he hated Shane's guts and telling him that he could not stop evil, while Shane retorted that Kane is pathetic and not evil for failing to accommodate himself into normal society. Which is quite a bland way to end what has been quite a literally insane build-up. And in the end, even with his attempts at trying, Shane could not vanquish the big red monster, getting put into the ambulance following a tombstone onto the concrete aisleway after 13 minutes and 34 seconds of action. Now, considering how mental this feud had been, with the elaborate and violent spots throughout, the distinct lack of those in this contest was very disappointing on reflection. These two have been trying to kill each other since July in every way they could, and to have it end on an athletic, yet very meagre whimper was quite annoying to watch. It went as long as I thought it would in terms of length, with Shane doing all he could in the confines of his limited skill set, and Kane's hard-hitting offense to make something out of it, but a lack of major spots combined with a tepid crowd who had their view of backstage cut off twice by poor cameras, it really didn't do what was needed to end this feud off with an explosion of insanity. It still had its moments and showcased Kane as a monster in a limited but striking capacity, while Shane's reputation as a daredevil made this match feel a little bit better than it honestly could have been. But the momentum shifted so quickly that this match seemingly rushed itself to a finish, making the pain that both men were apparently meant to be suffering not feel as realistic as it honestly should have been, considering we were in an ambulance match here. It should have been to the point where these two could not walk. It didn't bloody look like it. And okay, the use of an ambulance as a weapon being hit or jumped into, as well as the moves on the floor and the use of a second ambulance and a car, was enough to elevate it up a little... And if, but if given more time, this match could have been great. With more liberties involved to get properly violent, this match could have been amazing. But this was nowhere near what so many people going into this show and looking back on it really should have expected. It was a one and a half star brawl that really could have set the standard for future ambulance matches, but instead it set a pretty low bar. It was okay, but not as special as it honestly could have been. And not to mention, it was definitely not as good or as interesting as the commentators have been building it up to be.
Now, following that, we got a segment between coach Eric Bischoff and the Dallas Mavericks owner Mark Cuban. Now, this this segment didn't really have much of a purpose and took up a lot of time. And this is why Tajiri and Jamie Noble's Cruiserweight title match was pushed onto Sunday Night Heat instead. I would have preferred the match, in all fairness, because I had a decent amount of build-up going into it. I wouldn't have mentioned it in the intro if we weren't meant to talk about it. Oh well, at least he took the RKO like a champ and Orton got a lot of heat for taking the popular billionaire down. Seriously, it was really pointless. Anyway, following that clusterfuck, we got some in-ring action finally, as SmackDown held the WWE Tag Team Championship match, with the champions the Basham Brothers taking on Los Guerreros. Now, following Eddie's loss of the US Championship at No Mercy to the Big Show, you would think it couldn't get any worse for him. Well, indeed, it bloody could, as Los Guerreros lost the tag team titles to the Bashams, the SmackDown following the pay-per-view. The reason why is quite interesting, as Shelton Benjamin and Charlie Haas were meant to be the ones challenging the Guerreros. But Paul Heyman, coming in as new GM, punished them for not calling him while he was out following their team angle days. Continuity at its best, people, as he awarded the sex-obsessed Bashams a chance that they took and subsequently made bank with. Now, Chavo had been trying to get Eddie hyped up beforehand, but that was, of course, to no avail as he walked out following the match's conclusion, with his irritants continuing the following week as the younger Guerrero continued to slate his uncle about what happened, even telling him that he was at the same low as he was when he was a struggling alcoholic and drug addict. And this struck home with Eddie, admitting he hadn't been in the right frame of mind considering he had busted ribs going into that No Mercy match, but that was not acknowledged, agreeing with the fans that he did indeed suck. And with Chavo by his side, he could do everything that he could do to make himself better and become champions again as a team, something that Shaniqua and the Bashams did not agree with as they double-teamed Latino Heat with Chavo saving the day, with an incensed Eddie demanding from Heyman that he got a title shot. But of course, Heyman wanted them to earn it only if Eddie could beat the champions in a handicap match. With Chavo banned from ringside and against all odds, Eddie did it, distracting the champions by making it look like Danny had used Shaniqua's whip and getting a roll up to set the title match in stone for next week. And it was meant to happen, but it didn't come to pass as Eddie had to leave early to help his wife's sister, who had been involved in a car accident. But this was an elaborate plan by the Basham brothers to break Chavo down. And it did happen in a non-title handicap match in that same evening. And of course, the match ended up getting moved to the pay-per-view instead as a result. The struggles and animosity between Chavo and Eddie were really building more and more, but even with that, could the Guerreros vanquish their SM loving enemies and claim their pride and titles back? The answer is no, they couldn't. As Eddie was hit by Chavo's swinging DDT, Danny Basham rolled the younger Guerrero up with a handful of tights to get the shock win and retain the titles in 7 minutes and 31 seconds. Now, this match was a nice, quick, and athletic contest to compensate for the lack of in-ring excitement since SmackDown's opener some time ago. Eddie was a surprisingly decent opening sparring partner for the Bashams, and thanks to him foregoing the usual face in peril trope psychology-wise, it showed that he wanted to prove that he still had the desire to make Los Guerreros win again. And that was abundant in his free-flowing and crisp moves, with Chavo providing the same as the Bashams' combined tag team and bruising offense, alongside Shaniqua's surprise turn in this bout, helped it be quite a likeable one overall. The match, I feel, though, was too short, and while it had the crowd behind it, because, of course, you have two guys from El Paso in here, it honestly had a really annoying shock finish and result, which meant they really couldn't make this match any more lively than it was in the limited time they had. Just when they were really starting to get into it and really got in behind it, the match finished. That tense atmosphere that was needed to build up to that explosive feel-good victory just was not there. Uh, and it is really sad that the quality of this match was extinguished before it had the chance to really get off the ground, even though it did manage to do so in what limited time it had. The Guerrero should have won here to give this Dallas crowd something to cheer about, but as I've mentioned, they're two citizens of El Paso for God's sake. They should have. But they didn't, and all in all, even though it was a fast-paced match with solid momentum shifts and enough story interwoven into it, it was exciting enough to warrant a two-star rating, but because the proper winners weren't there, and it was just too short, and it just wasn't, wasn't what it could have been, this doesn't go any higher, and 
I really was quite disappointed watching this back. I thought, you know, this is building into something fantastic, and I'm just disappointed they didn't take advantage of it. Then again, they knew what they wanted to do. They wanted to get the story of the Guerreros cemented in stone for their eventual dissension not long afterwards. I understand that, but it's still annoying in retrospect. The hindsight is great, but still, I really would have liked something different. But then again, on the positive side, this was the Basham's best match in WWE by far. And when it was against the Guerreros, you really shouldn't have expected anything less. And following on from that, we get the match that I am most excited about. Raw's Survivor Series Elimination Match that featured Team Austin, consisting of Shawn Michaels, the Intercontinental Champion Rob Van Dam, the World Tag Team Champions, the Dudley Boys, and Booker T, taking on Team Bischoff, consisting of Chris Jericho, Randy Orton, Christian, Scott Steiner, and Mark Henry. Oh, this is good. Now, following SummerSlam and Unforgiven, Bischoff and Austin continue to butt heads, as you would expect, with Bischoff himself and any heel who would open their mouths, in particular Jericho, complained that their lack of success on Raw was because of Austin's doing. Of course, Jericho saying, when he moved to Raw, he was expected to do great things, but Austin was the man who ruined it. Really? He was on Raw from when? June, July, the year prior? I wouldn't consider that mostly Austin's fault, even in retrospect. Now, following Austin's interference in a Goldberg-Jericho title bout, Austin got suspended for a week, only to attack Jericho and award Rob Van Dam a title match against the former, winning the ladder match to become the new champion. Now, following the Kane limo accident, though, as we alluded to earlier, Bischoff again put blame on Austin, as it was his co-GM that months prior had pushed Kane too far. While Coach, no longer the Raw announcer, following a match that was made by Austin's hands to get the Unforgiven match between Jerry Lawler and JR and him and Al Snow overturned, he was even more aggrieved alongside the former champion Jericho, complaining to have Austin removed as general manager, using what happened to Kane and Shane as proof that he'd done a very horrific job, even though everything else was starting to pile up. Now, with Austin under pressure and wanting to relieve the stress, he couldn't, because he was still restrained by that no provocation clause. He couldn't really do anything, begging Scott Steiner to hit him in order to let out his anger, which led to a beatdown not only for Big Papa Pump, but also Stacey Keebler too. Now, with an apology to Test and Stacey Keebler failing, resulting in Test eating a stunner for his troubles, Bischoff had said that Austin had become quite sad thanks to that no provocation clause, but he offered him a way out of it by proclaiming he'd lift it if an Austin picked Survivor Series team could beat a team picked by Bischoff at Survivor Series. However, if Bischoff's team won, Austin would be fired as general manager. Now, Austin asked the fans if this was a risk worth taking. They responded with a hell yeah, and the match was signed for Survivor Series, with Bischoff announcing Steiner in place of an injured test and an aggrieved Chris Jericho as his first two picks, while Booker T joined his fellow Texan on the face side. Now, on the highlight reel, the next week, a planned ambush by Jericho, Steiner, and the newly announced member Christian on Booker failed as Van Damme made the save confirming his place on Austin's team. Now, later on that night following a title match where, thanks to Austin's call, the Intercontinental title match was won by Jericho, but then restarted inside a cage only for Van Damme to win the title back. I remember this moment clearly, it was damn fantastic, as Mark Henry and the Dudley boys assisted the other members of Bischoff and Austin's teams respectively to try and even the score. However, it was to no available as Bischoff's team came out on top inside the confinements of that cage. And with four of his team confirmed, Austin had to find someone else. He came across Shawn Michaels, who'd been feuding with Mark Henry, trying to protect Goldberg, which we'll get to later in the last few weeks prior. And he asked if he would be the final member, despite all they'd been through in the past, i.e. WrestleMania 14, which the Heartbreak Kid agreed, only for Bischoff to announce his final member, Randy Orton, the man who beat Sean at Unforgiven, to round it all off. The contract for this match was signed, with Bischoff noting Austin's moniker of don't trust anybody was a lie and that he was a fraud, having to trust five other men in order to save his job, and to do so for the first time in his life. With Austin stating the risk, just like he highlighted when he got the match signed in the first place, was a risk worth taking just so he could be himself again. And on the final Raw before the pay-per-view, all the members of both teams faced off against each other in singles matches, with Austin's team wiping the slate clean with five consecutive victories. But Bischoff... 
You could tell being his smarmy self was quietly confident, noting that even though Austin was instrumental for putting WCW, his company, out of business, he finds it ironic, in his opinion, that he would be the one to get rid of the bionic redneck that he fired all those years ago, once and for all. And through underhanded tactics, Bischoff could smile as much as he wants, and very proudly, as he got his wish fulfilled with Randy Orton picking up the win as the sole survivor, pinning a bloody Shawn Michaels off an interfering Batista's Batista bomb, to seal the heel team's victory after 27 minutes and 27 seconds of very intense action. Now, following this contest, Austin shook hands with the disheartened Michaels and gave the fans in Dallas a very emotional speech. To be interrupted by Coach, which resulted in the assault of some security guards and a frightened coach getting a massive stunner. He drank some Steve Weisers one more time and left the empty cans in the ring, departing for what seemed to be the last time. Now, I'm annoyed we saw him only a month later before the turn of the year, and he was back in the GM role as a sheriff, just doing what he wants to, which was really bad. But this was a nice moment, <laughs> and while that didn't last, it was a great way to cap off the storyline and the match that came before it. And well, what more can I say about the first big match that I ever saw live, proving, as it always does, that it never ceases to disappoint, at least me. It is still one of my favourites of all time, and now it's time to highlight as why that is the case. As it had Austin and Bischoff's feud end on such tender hooks and drama, it was scintillating as this bout progressed from a decidedly average one in the first half to its second half excelling as a triumph of storytelling, pace, and investment as a bloody and all Shawn Michaels nearly fought back to get Austin the win that many wanted. And while they didn't get that, this match deservedly got the time to weave its narrative together and it paid off superbly, giving Austin the farewell his character needed in the right place and at the right time. Now sure, as I've mentioned, he would return one month later, but for this moment, it was all well and good. The crowd were into it from the first minute, creating a partisan coliseum-like atmosphere while keeping respectfully measured in order to utilize their sound to make the final 15 minutes be absolutely incredible, all while they fell silent at the shocking turn of events that would end it. It was remarkably consistent in pace too, giving enough shifts and momentum to make both teams feel equal. And despite Austin having more star power, that is a really good thing. And it was an even fight that just never stops being enjoyable for me to watch. And while it would have been appreciated with a little more selling, some move variety, and maybe one slow movement to ease the tension at some point to round out the fives, this still resonates as an absolute favourite of mine, one that showed that laboured build in the Austin and Bischoff rivalry was worth waiting to see pay off, because everything up until that point was a very mixed bag. And seriously, when you look at the drama and the underhanded nature of how these two went against each other and interwove other superstars into it, it was great! Then you have the Redneck Triathlon at Bad Blood being the absolute worst of it because toilet humour was not necessary in a feud between two guys who hated each other for over a decade. And that's the point. That is the point, ladies and gentlemen, because this match needed a very intense, dramatic, and forceful hand to make sure that this feud ended on the right note. And you know what? Even with Austin ruining it by coming back a month or so later, they did that. This feud ended on the perfect conclusion. And as a result, for me, it negates everything bad it did and showed it was a worthy use of our time on Monday Night Raw to build up to this climactic match. And as a result, because I love it so, it gets a stone cold five star rating from me. But only just, as if I were to knock one of those fives into a 4.5 territory, it would have been a four and three quarter match. So this bout can count its lucky stars. I'm in a good mood and I'm willing to give it the five stars that I believe it deserves. And the thing is, I'm a little sad even with that because this match should have main evented the pay-per-view because the two matches that had to follow it ended up being a lot flatter than they honestly should have been. And speaking of one of those matches, we have the Buried Alive match, the main event from SmackDown between The Undertaker and Vince McMahon. Now, No Mercy was the turning point in Taker and McMahon's rivalry, having been at loggerheads verbally for months over the chairman's countless disregard for his own family, and that became professionally personal against the dead man, following Vince costing him the biker chain match against Brock Lesnar at 
no mercy for the title. Now, the following SmackDown and incensed Big Evil demanded the new GM Paul Heyman gave him what he wants, a shot at Lesnar and a shot at McMahon. Now, Paul gave in as he put Taker in a handicap match between Lesnar and the Big Show, with the stipulation being that if he won, he would get any type of match he wanted at any time against whoever the hell he would want. Now, Heyman proceeded to reverse Taker's victory twice, restarting the match under new rules because Vince McMahon wanted Taker to suffer, but the dead man still came out on top. An angry Vince sought to kick Taker's beaten body down by stating that as long as he's breathing in and breathing out, in a quote I still love, he'd never be WWE Champion. Never! Demanding to know what Taker had in mind for his match choice, though. He still wanted to know. Taker unveiled a Buried Alive match stipulation. And he chose Survivor Series to be the location. Now, of course, the delusional McMahon would think Lesnar. He wanted a shot at Lesnar and the championship. And, of course, saying that Taker would be buried six feet under by Brock. Logically. The smile, though, was wiped off his face as Taker said instead it would be the unlucky chairman who would be his victim. Oh boy, I still love that moment to this day. It's glorious, even with Taker laughing his head off afterwards. Lovely. Now this led to an equally incensed McMahon the next week, <laughs> having his problems worsen even more as Heyman gave Taker time off until Survivor Series following that beating. Meaning that the chairman not only threatened to fire Heyman for putting his adv adversary in such a favourable position twice, but to also burn Taker's house down and have his wife Sarah gang raped. Good lord, I can't believe that came out of a chairman's mouth. Now, Heyman did, to his credit, against all odds, manage to convince Vince not to panic and be the ruthless bastard who fought against Ted Turner, Stone Cold, and the government, not allowing his fear to overcome him. Taker, though, he used his time wisely while he was off, building anticipation to what he would end up hoping would be a bloodbath, summing up simply in a pre-taped segment that after all that Vince had done professionally to his employees, such as Bret Hart and Stone Cold, to his daughter Stephanie and wife Linda, and even son Shane, even though that wasn't implied, as well as personally to the dead man's own family, that he needs to be held accountable for his actions, while the chairman under a lone spotlight begged to be forgiven for all he's done, and prayed, no begged, to a higher power to atone him for his sins and choose him to be the one to bury Taker alive. Now on the final Smackdown, Taker ominously threatened McMahon by filling a makeshift grave with dirt in a great segment I may add, while McMahon got a priest in to bless him and pray only for the seemingly insane Vince to say that the priest should be praying for Undertaker instead, knowing what could go down in Survivor Series, as he believed the higher power protected him and would lead him to absolution. Now, as we know, there was a higher power on McMahon's side, who was about eight inches taller than himself, to be exact. Kane interfered off a pyro explosion, puncturing Taker into the grave, with McMahon dropping the dirt out of the digger onto said grave in 11 minutes and 59 seconds. Now, the crowd were enjoying McMahon's beating up until then, and left the match chanting bullshit. No doubt, but that's also doubled when you consider this statistic. All of the home state men of Texas except for Mark Henry, lost their matches on this night. That is ridiculous. And following on from that, I know what many of you are going to say. That this is a bad match. I will always attest to the contrary, but only to some degree. As a bloody culmination of McMahon's years of power-hungry debauchery, authoritarianism, and over-the-top violence stemming from the Montreal screw job, this was a perfect opportunity for an endgame. To see Taker brutalize a man who the fans had wanted to see get beaten that badly for years is something that even back in 2003, with me only having watched McMahon be an asshole for a year at that point, was still as satisfying as it is today. And Vince sold it perfectly, even with the callback to the 1998 ankle injury with the steps that Taker caused was a nice touch that firmly helped bring this match's storytelling higher than it had any right to be, and it was an absolute bloodbath and there's blood everywhere, and it was just the most satisfying thing. And of course, Kane's interference helped to no end either. 
However, as I alluded to earlier, the crowd was still reeling from Austin's team defeat, and they didn't really revel in the beating of Vince as much as I really expected them to, and it made the match feel flat, and the slow pace didn't help either. For me, it, it was warranted for the story, and it was justified, but despite not helping the crowd at all, it honestly went longer than it should have. And overall, if, if I didn't enjoy watching McMahon getting beaten to a bloody mess as much as I did, this match would have not really even registered at all. It's still fun to watch, but doesn't have a lot going for it to get above a one-star rating. It is a bad match, but one you can't seem to keep your eyes off regardless. Even though its placement on the card, like many matches on this show, including some results, were wrong for sure. We now reach the main event, where the World Heavyweight Championship of Raw is at stake, as the incumbent champion Goldberg took on Triple H. Now at Unforgiven, Goldberg finally defeated the game to win the belt, ending Evolution's leader's reign of terror. Triple H, though, being a man of his word to make Goldberg believe that he, the cerebral assassin, is indeed someone who would do anything to get his title back while he recovers from his injuries, offered up a $100,000 bounty to anyone who could take the champion out with the winner, even potentially getting a spot in Evolution if he's able to pull it off. Then Goldberg subsequently survived attacks and matches against Mark Henry, Stephen Richards, Lance Storm, Larry Zistance, Randy Orton, and Ric Flair respectfully, with Shawn Michaels having his back as well, just to ensure that Triple H didn't get his way. And after a month of avoiding pain, Goldberg, though, had to succumb eventually to the pressure, and he did, at the hands of Evolution's own Batista, who returned from his injuries, attacking the champion with a chair following his match with Ric Flair, crossing an ankle in said chair, and collecting the bounty, keeping the money, and Evolution stable free of outside impurities to their bloodline. Now, Bischoff congratulated Evolution for taking Goldberg out, as Bischoff was annoyed that after Unforgiven, Goldberg refused Bischoff's congratulations, because obviously Bischoff, being the egotist he is, tried to inflate his own ego by proclaiming that he created Goldberg. Logically, but before he was able to get the title presented to Triple H, Stone Cold interrupted and refused to strip Goldberg of the title, announcing the title match for Survivor Series. Now, after having his back, Goldberg attempted to save Austin from a beatdown the following week, even with his injured ankle, getting a match with Batista in order to stop the potential stunner for refusing to drink a steam wiser with the rattlesnake. It was pretty solid. Now, on the final Raw, Triple H confidently assured Evolution and himself that he would whoop the one-legged man in an ass-kicking contest, because he, of course, wrote the book on kicking ass. I love that quote. Love it. He then interfered in Goldberg's match with Batista later on in the evening, but before he was able to land the sledgehammer on the champion, Goldberg responded with a spear, taking the animal out with the game's own weapon of choice to equal the odds. And at the end of the day, Goldberg had the heat going in, and despite a concerted effort by Triple H and Evolution, Goldberg could not be stopped as he won and retained off the spear and jackhammer, in a surprisingly short 11 minutes and 44 seconds. Now, let's talk about this one, shall we? Because this was a title match. At the end of a pay-per-view, surely it had to do something good. Well, as you can tell by the ratings on screen, it obviously didn't, as it was even more boring than I ever remembered it being. The chemistry between these two was for the most part non-existent, and I will give Triple H some credit. He stuck to the story, and worked the ankle for most of the time he was on offense, giving me something to be happy about. But that was completely ruined, completely ruined by the champion. Goldberg, right? Didn't sell the ankle off of spearing Triple H within the first minute before the match had even properly started. He even kicked the ring steps with the bad ankle. And this was before Triple H got offense, meaning most of that psychological work did not matter when Triple H tried to wear him down. So when Goldberg was selling, I just thought, you know what? There is nothing I can do because you're just going to recover straight back up like it didn't even bloody matter. Uh, and to add to the tedium, the crowd were not hot for the near falls or Triple H's great psychology work until Evolution came in and the sledgehammer was in play. They woke up eight minutes into a near 12 minute match waiting for the inevitable and it was a very long winded way of getting to it. Now this match, considering it went shorter than I would have expected a main title match, when you look at what happened in it, it went longer than it should have. When looking at where and just how slow the momentum shifted, 
It shouldn't have felt as boring as it did, but when you realise the crowd barely cared and Goldberg's lack of selling for the most part was on show, you know it wasn't going to light the soul on fire, and even with Evolution interfering, they helped too late to generate some excitement for a match that, in my opinion, did not deserve to close out this show. It's a three quarters of a star match, and surprisingly is the worst one of this whole evening. Despite Molly Holly and the Bashams being on show. That's ridiculous. Even the ambulance match was better than this. And that was bad even by recollection statements. <sighs> That's the thing. This was a woeful way to end the show. A title match that fizzled out before it had any chance to justify itself. And finally, I didn't note this in my reviews of Bad Blood 03 and SummerSlam 03 respectively, but the WWE Network have dubbed over Goldberg's WWE produced theme with his WCW one and inserting a lot of Goldberg chants really loudly to mask over it more. It's really off-putting, and it sums up my awkwardness and feeling for about that had the right psychological ingredients to be a good match, but with two performers who couldn't gel, when matched up with an annoying crowd, they could barely celebrate a loved champion retaining a title after seeing that. <sighs> and after all this, ladies and gentlemen, it is time for me to sum up my final thoughts on this show. I remember this night as a joyous one back in November 2003, having celebrated my birthday a few days prior. Watching this show and seeing some intense storylines end was something that gripped me for weeks beforehand and afterwards, leading into WrestleMania 20's build-up. However, looking back on this event and scaling my nostalgia down, it's easy to see that this show was a laborious thing to sit through, not just for me, but for the crowd in attendance on that night. And having only two, let me say it, two face victories out of seven, bookending a card that was, as John Cena noted in his show opening promo, ass backwards. It really felt like that in places and was very, very disappointing to see, with the matches from the women's bout onwards being in the wrong placement as the match that should have been evented being on before it should have, robbing the two latter matches of any energy. And speaking of which, it doesn't end there as there were so many heel victories, the crowd had no real investment as moments to liven them up and cheer were blown out and were never used effectively. If Lita and Los Guerreros had won, could you imagine how much brighter this card would have felt, considering Taker, Shane and Austin's losses were quite big and took a lot of heat out of the Dallas patrons who had to wait to be rewarded for their patience, or should I say lack of rewarding for their patience? The tag title match was surprisingly better than I thought it to be, which when you put up with the two elimination matches gave this card more of a stable foot to stand on, but the rest of this card just failed to deliver despite most of them not entering major negative equity even albeit by our nose. This card is saved by the matches that gave this event its name, and while my nostalgia still makes it an enjoyable one to watch, the poor quality of most of it, a lacklustre crowd, incorrect card placement, and wasting time on segments that could have added another match to the card to bridge the gaps, prevented a show that looked solid on paper from delivering on its potential. It may be a show that I look back on fondly, but I'm happy my current review system exists, and it has shown its problems for all to see as I've finally given a review that is as non-biased as possible and I can officially be proud of. Overall, Survivor Series 2003 gets an underwhelming score of 3.75 out of 10. It's nothing special despite having a good couple of bouts to its name. It just didn't pull its weight throughout the duration of its time and when looking back on this show, it just doesn't hold up too well. If they'd executed it better, Maybe it would have fared more positively from me and the crowd, but we're sadly left with an event that promised much and let down many. And the thing is, the next Friday flashback isn't happening until November due to Equestria Girls Month throughout the entire period. So I'm hoping that the next big four installment, the Royal Rumble 2004, can save some face and start off a brand new year in this series well. But knowing the event and what it had on the card outside of a couple of matches, I'm worried that it will not be able to save <laughs> its dignity after what this show had put it through. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. The Survivor Series 2003 Friday Flashback Review is done. I hope you've all enjoyed this. And I hope you have, because I've had to record this with quite a bad sinus and throat infection. I'm not sure if it highlighted itself at any point during this review, 
but I'm telling you right now, I am not feeling too well. And I just want to get out of here as quickly as possible, and I have to end with the right things. So, how did you all feel about this show? Was it as bad as I said? Am I actually too harsh on something that I really loved back in the day? Or is it entirely justified? Put your comments down in the comment section. I'd be glad to hear them. And if you do not want to miss out on the next Friday flashback event pay-per-view show in November, which of course, as I've said, is Raw Rumble 2004, all you have to do is click that subscribe button down there and give this video a cheeky like. I would gladly appreciate it. So until then, well, these pay-per-view flashbacks will be put on another month's hiatus, but in that time, I will hopefully improve in my personal health to deliver a video where, on the audio front, I don't sound like a congested weasel, if that has indeed been the case. But until then, I have been Freddie Thomas, you've been people listening, this has been another Friday flashback pay-per-view review for the CC Network, and I will see you all next time.